First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. OK, everybody, welcome back to the new term. I hope you've all had a good break and that you're keen to start on your research project. What I'd like to do this morning is to give you a chance to ask questions about the project. Requirements, ways of approach, how to get help if you need it. Today is informal. It may be already written on paper, but it's nice to have an opportunity to have it confirmed. So, any questions? Dr. Archer, is there a confirmed due date yet to hand it in? Yes, I can now confirm that it's 16th of July, not 15th as first advised, OK? And what about the word limit? Well, there is some flexibility on this, but in general it's eight to 10,000 words. Ah, I see. And you can choose your topic, anything from years two and three. Yes? I still can't work out what I want to do it on. Who, um... In that case, you should see your course tutor to agree on your final topic. And you should also be aware that there is special assistance available at the library on library resources if you need help on that. Can I just check on the deadlines for everything? Certainly. Look, let me write it on the board when each stage should be completed. First of all, you've got to work on your basic project outline and that's due in to your course tutor by 21st of February which is only two weeks away, so you need to get cracking on that. Do we have to include a full reference list by then too? No, your reference list is due on 6th of April, which is one week later, so you have time to discuss this with your tutor. And when should we be doing the research? Well, that's over a one-month period, essentially April to May. And the write-up? Well, you need to do quite a bit of research before you get going on your writing. So that's really May to July, with a due date for handing in on the 16th. Any more questions? Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Well, sir, just some advice, really. It's about the research approach. Would you advise us to use some case studies? Well, Larry, I know these can be difficult to arrange sometimes, but I really feel they are of great benefit in this subject. You can always talk to your tutor if you're having difficulty. Yes? I've looked over some previous research projects that are in the library. Is that a good idea, sir? I heard. OK. I don't think you should go through them in detail, especially at this early stage, or you might end up being influenced by them more than you realise. But yes, it really is about the best guide you can have to what's required in the... to what's expected in this type of project. Sorry, Judy, I butted in on you. That's all right. It's just that I noticed one project was a joint one. They work together as a pair. Is that a good idea? Yes, I remember that paper. Working in a pair can have some advantages. But to be frank, this is meant to be an individual project, so it's best to work on your own. About using subjects, is it OK if we use family members? Your own relatives? I don't see why not. They probably offer some advantages in terms of availability. Although you need to guard against possible effects on your research outcomes. So, you can if you want. Perhaps you should discuss this with your tutor if you plan to use relatives, so you can approach it in the best way. OK, okay thanks. OK then. Well, I hope we've been able to sort out a few things. You're welcome to see me at any time, or drop me a note if you have any more queries. Fine, Fine thanks. thanks. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part two. Part two. Two. You are going to hear a talk given by an international student. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen to the tape and answer the questions. As an international student coming from Sierra Leone, it gives me great honor to give these opening remarks and welcome you all to Ashisi University, where excellence is the code. I believe I speak on behalf of my fellow colleagues when I say we feel that we are the most fortunate and privileged university students in Ghana. You may ask, what is the basis of such a conclusion? And I will simply say to you, in which other tertiary institution in Ghana do you find the same level of IT infrastructure and facilities available to students? Where also do you find such a low ratio of students to lecturers and computers? In which other educational institution do you find 55% of students on some sort of financial aid who in addition enjoy services and benefits such as job placement after graduation, on-campus employment that pays above the minimum wage, a supply of textbooks, and access to online databases. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no other institution of higher education in Ghana today that matches the learning environment and the quality of instruction at Ashisi. I could continue listing reasons why we students feel this way, but I only have five minutes for this speech. Believe me, I could go on for hours. At Ashisi, everyone is considered a leader and is treated special. Ashisi equips us with the necessary determination, strength, and belief in ourselves to be able to achieve our goals. We are being taught to think outside the box and to question and challenge our assumptions about the world we live in. This, ladies and gentlemen, is one of the benefits of a liberal arts education, which seeks to broaden our intellectual capacity. Now look at questions 17 to 20. As the talk continues, answer questions 17 to 20. At Ashisi, we are also exposed to real-life situations and learn how to deal with them through a practical and vigorous academic program, as well as various seminars in which prominent leaders in their professions are invited as guests to interact and share their knowledge and experiences. Some people, even some of you in this audience, may believe that tuition at Ashisi is too high. But I say to you that the students here are unanimous in saying it is worth it. Not because we all come from well-to-do families, but because when it comes to one's education, you need to aim at getting the best from the right place. One's education defines who you are and what your perception of life and society will become. Ashisi offers us a top-quality education which meets high international standards. This is due to the strong linkages the school has established with three of the very best schools in the United States, namely Swarthmore College, which is ranked as the best liberal arts school in the U.S., UC Berkeley, and the University of Washington. In addition, Ashisi has recruited an excellent faculty consisting of lecturers from various countries, including Ghana, the U.K., and the United States. These lecturers are among the best in their respective academic fields. I believe this is the school's greatest asset, a strong and knowledgeable team dedicated to achieving successful results from their students and who also love their job. I would like to end with a personal message. My fellow students, because we are among the most privileged in our society, we should take responsibility for our own destinies, make our parents proud, 
and create a legacy for those that follow us and Africa as a whole. We must give back to our society after completing school and achieving our goals in life, which I believe we all can, if we properly utilize our time and take advantage of all that is offered here at Ashisi. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between two students who will discuss a project they're working on together. You have 30 seconds to look at questions 21 to 27. Hey Jess, glad you could make it. We've got a lot to discuss. Hi Matt. Yes, sorry I'm a bit late. I did bring all my notes with me. Yes, me too. Where shall we start? Well, I think it would be a good idea to clarify our objectives just one more time. Yes, good idea. Okay, here we are. We need to record, photograph and identify the plant species in 10 one square meter plots. Does it say anything about where these plots should be and how they should be laid out? Ah, here it is. It says that all the plots need to be no more than 10 metres apart. And how do we choose them? Ah, this is the fun part. I remember this. Here we are. Make a one metre square frame using bamboo sticks available from the department stores. Yes, we've, we've already done that. I know, I'm just reading the whole section. OK. One person stands roughly in the middle of the chosen area and throws the frame. The other person uses a tape to mark out the square where the frame landed and returns frame to thrower. The thrower then turns a few degrees on the spot and throws again. The thrower must turn slightly after each throw and vary the force of the throw until after the tenth throw they are pointing in almost the same direction as the first. That sounds a bit complicated. That's only because it's all in writing. It's just a simple throw, turn, throw, turn, throw, turn, until we have ten squares. And I guess you want to do the throwing. Well, if you don't mind. I'm sure you'll be more accurate at marking the squares. Yes, I am sure I am, and I'm sure you've got a stronger throwing arm. You now have 30 seconds to look at questions 28 to 30. OK, good. We've got that sorted. Now we need to decide where to go. Yes, I've been thinking about that and I've brought the map. Ah, well done. I forgot mine. Now, I've identified three possible locations, but they've all got some disadvantages. OK, fire away. Well, the area around this lowland marsh could be interesting. There'll be a lot of interesting water plants here. Looks good, but what's the problem? Mainly that it's already a designated nature reserve, and I think there's already been a lot of research done here. Ah, I see. Well, I'd rather do something that's new and can be useful. 
I agree. That's why I identified this area further west. See, here, behind the beach. Oh, yes, I see. That area there, where it's flat, but quite high. Exactly. If you look a bit further inland, you'll see that there are hills which will protect that area from strong north winds. I see. Excellent. But what's the problem? Just that it may not be very interesting. We know that the geology there is not conducive to a wide variety of plants. Mm, I agree. So, what's your last idea? Well, I think this one is a bit of a winner, although I did want to show you the other two. Look up here on the north coast. Where? See this bay? Well, I know that there's been quite a lot of studies done here, but a bit further to the east behind this headland. No one has ever looked at that. Well, I certainly couldn't see any studies. That is interesting. And the plant life could be a bit different because of the shelter from the wind the headland provides. Exactly. Brilliant, Jessica. That's a great idea. We'll go there. Thanks. Now all we have to decide is when is a good time. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a lecturer giving a talk on a type of fundraising for business called crowdfunding. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning everyone. Today we're continuing our look at funding opportunities for small startup businesses. The emergence of social media has given companies the ability to connect with fans and potential customers directly. On the back of the growth in social media, a model of raising finance has emerged known as crowdfunding. This revolutionary way of raising finance began with micro-lending in the 90s. More recently, an equity-based model has emerged that allows people to invest directly in a new company. We're going to examine this in more detail later, but let's turn first to a third model, which I'll term a fan-based model. With this model of crowdfunding, Individuals are encouraged to give an amount of money to support the launch of a project or initiative without the promise of any financial return. Instead, there's a reward for donating. This contrasts with the micro-lending model, which would require a return on investment, and the equity-based scheme, which may offer shares. Crowdfunding portals or websites allow the business concerned to present the initiative along with the financial target required. There's a fixed time limit for fundraising, and if the target amount is reached, all donations are paid to the company or individual. Whether it's an author planning to write a new book, an independent film company looking to make a new film, or a technology company with an idea for an app, the person or company needing funding would turn to its fan base for support. This is managed through one of the many crowdfunding online portals that have emerged. Of course, a fan or supporter of a particular initiative 
is likely to give money anyway. But donation-based crowdfunding will often make donating even more attractive by offering a rewards-based incentive scheme. Let's take a film company, for example, that needs funding for a new film. For a small, set donation, the donor might be offered a free ticket to the premiere or a DVD of the film. A larger set donation might be rewarded by the chance to attend a launch event when the film goes live. Those people who make bigger donations could even be offered the chance to meet the cast of the film, whilst the highest level donation could see the person's name mentioned in the film credits. For companies that already have a significant fan base, crowdfunding offers a fantastic opportunity to raise money quickly from a large number of people each of whom donates just a small amount of money. Compare this to the time and effort that would be needed to sell your idea to investors or your bank manager, particularly in an age when raising finance can be difficult. The company may also have links with partner companies or organisations that run fundraising events. In this case, you can significantly increase participation by working with these organisations to promote your crowdfunding project. Another significant advantage is that you can reach out to your fan base for feedback on the project while it's being developed, thus making the final product more appealing. Crowdfunding enables you to raise awareness of the product at an early stage, thus increasing the potential for sales. With so many people behind you, it can also act as a great incentive to get the best possible product out on time and on budget. However, there are disadvantages to bear in mind. The model can be described as all or nothing. If you don't reach the monetary target required in the agreed time, all promises of donations are cancelled and no money is paid, leaving you back at square one. Should this happen, or still worse, you receive the funding but are unable to come up with the product, not only will your fans end up disappointed, but the portal will record the fact that you failed to reach your target or that the initiative failed. Fulfilling all the pledges that you've made to people can also be very time-consuming. For example, remembering to send out copies of books or free cinema tickets can sometimes be forgotten in the excitement and frenzy of launching your product. People sometimes forget to factor in the cost of rewards when calculating profit margins. But these can be significant. And finally, if you have a small fan base, for example, you're a new company or have a small social media footprint, raising awareness of your initiative will be challenging. These drawbacks aside, donation-based crowdfunding is a wonderful opportunity for individuals or small startups to raise funds for that exciting new project whilst reaching out and connecting to the people who are most likely to support and promote your work for you. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.